Who wants coming? I asked as I jumped into the truck. I know Sabrina is for sure. Jacob told me as he put the truck into gear. The gravel cracked underneath the tires as the truck pulled out of my driveway. Yeah, and that's all you care about, right, Miko? Alex grabbed my shoulders from the back seat. I yelled. I didn't even know you were back there. man. You think I would miss a game? Alex said as he tossed me a can of beer. Have you asked her out to prom yet? It's not that simple. I pulled the tab on the can and took a sip. I hated the taste, but would never admit it. The moon was full as the three of us drove down the roads that had been our companions since childhood. I think it is, cousin, Jacob said. You just need to ask. Everyone knows you all like each other. Yeah, but I need to put some thought into it. I want it to be special. Oh, you're down bad, huh? Alex fell back in his seat and looked out the window. I've been there, man. Just be careful. That first one sticks with you. Where are we picking them up at anyways, Jacob? I asked, eager to change the subject. Down by Sasaqua. I guess they were at a party, but it ended early. Well, hell, let's roll some smoke and get down there. Alex said as he leaned between the two of us and turned the radio up. Jacob floored the accelerator, and the diesel engine roared, leaving a trail of dust in our wake. I watched the fields and pastures fly by us as we went. The road was a gray ribbon in the moonlight. I rolled the window down and took in the aroma of the summer air. Heavy rains had led to an early hay cut. It smelled like the end of the school year outside. The fields gave way to patches of dense woods as we neared the small town of Sasaqua. The giant oaks stood tall and silent as we approached. An occasional gust of wind caused them to shift and turn towards us as if they were questioning why we entered into their domain. A deer suddenly appeared in the headlights and Jacob hit the brakes. The animal froze for a moment and then was gone. Look at her, Jacob said as we watched the doe's white tail bob up and down like a ghost weaving through the trees. I bet she has babies somewhere. I don't know. I said as I scanned the area. It's kind of early. The doe stopped and turned to face us. She cocked her head as if trying to figure out the answer to a question. Jacob eased off the brake and the truck rolled forward with a squeak. The doe lifted her head and pawed at the ground. I think you might be right, Jacob told me. She's awfully wide. I don't think she's dropped them yet. The soon-to-be mama snorted and blew at us as she twitched her tail. Look at that, she's missing one of her ears. What does it matter? Alex interrupted. Let's go. Jacob let the truck creep forward until we were well beyond the deer. We crossed the tracks of a long abandoned railroad and found ourselves in Sasaqua. The boarded up buildings and abandoned stores told the story of a town well beyond its prime. Man, this place always makes me nervous. Nothing good ever happens here. Alex said as we pulled into the parking lot of the general store, the only business still in operation. We'll get the girls and get on down the road. Jacob looked around as he spoke. They're supposed to meet us here. The store was made of brick and looked as if it had been built when the town was established. A single yellow bulb lit the interior of the building where an older man stood behind the counter in overalls. Aren't y'all related to that guy? Alex pointed at the clerk with the can of beer he held in his hand. Way down the line, I told him as I took a sip of my own drink. The liquid had gotten warm, and I almost spit it out but caught myself. The last time I let a beer get hot, Alex wouldn't stop bugging me about it. I told you to drink it, not babysit it, was all I heard the rest of that night. He's our uncle, I think. Cousin, Jacob corrected me. His name's Harold. We don't know him real well, though keeps to himself. My grandma always told me he was kind of off. Different, you know? How do you keep track of such a big family? You don't. I laughed. You just have to ask a lot of questions and check before you start dating someone. Most of the Seminoles around here are related one way or another. That's why you have a thing for Sabrina, huh? Red hair and green eyes. Ain't no way she's kin to you all. Well, that's not the only reason, I said as I felt my cheeks get warm. She's just different. A set of headlights wound around the corner and lit up the truck. The car slowed and then whipped into the space next to us. Jacob rolled down his windows as the girls approached. 
It's about time y'all show up, he said. Shoot, we run on Indian time and we've been here waiting. Oh, shut up, Kelsey said as she got out of the small car. She stuck her tongue out at Jacob and he returned the gesture. I kept telling these two to hurry, but they just had to run home and redo their makeup. Another door opened and Sabrina stepped out. I felt the breath catch in my throat as she smiled at me. (laughs) I wasn't smart enough to write poetry like Shakespeare, but she sure made me want to try. The freckles on her face were a constellation that could make the heavens burn with envy. We did hurry, Sabrina giggled (laughs) while she helped Nikki out of the car. Besides, you boys would have waited all night if you had to. You know she's not wrong, Alex said as he tossed a beer to Kelsey. You just going to park here? Yeah, I think it'll be fine, don't you? She looked around to the empty streets. Doesn't seem like there's much traffic coming through here. Do they have a bathroom in there? Nikki asked. Yeah, they do, Jacob replied. Take her in there, Miko. I'll go with you. I have to go too, Sabrina said. I walked to the front of the store with the girls in tow behind me. I pushed open the door, and Harold stared at the three of us. Pesky, I said as I approached the counter. I'm Miko, Helen's boy. I'm not sure if you remember me. Yeah, I know who you are, Harold said as he gripped the sides of the cash register. We were wondering if we could steal your Chikochi. Harold moved his head to the side so that he could get a better view of the girls. He eyed them up and down and smiled. That'd be fine. He motioned to the area behind the counter. It's just back there through the hall. Mudo, I said as I helped Sabrina and Nikki over the small step that led to the employee's area. My heart fluttered when my hand touched Sabrina's. We made eye contact and she looked away with a grin. I'll wait out here for y'all. The two of them disappeared into the hallway. I thought the darkness swallowed them until a click gave way to a small sliver of light just under a door. Me and Harold stood there in silence until he began sniffing at the air. He took a long inhale through his nose and then looked at me. She's on her cycle, the blonde one. Huh? I asked, taking it back. It's her moon. Redhead isn't too far off either. Harold took another long inhale. We don't get many women back this way. Okay? I was stunned. I always respected my elders, but Harold was pushing his luck. You still go to ceremony up there at Gar Creek? Yeah, sometimes. Haven't been this year, though. Well, if you go, you can't be laying with them women. Shit, Harold, I know that. I spat out a response before thinking. My grandma would have my ass if she knew I was talking that way. But it's not like that. We're just out having some fun. Don't have to take that tone with me. Just trying to teach you young ones is all. A soft light erupted from the hallway and the girls emerged. I kept a close eye on Harold as the two of them walked towards us. The old man breathed in deeply as they went by. Thanks, mister, Nikki said as she passed. Yeah, we sure appreciate it. Don't mention it, Harold said. Y'all best be on your way. I'm gonna need to close up soon. We're heading out now. I kept my gaze on the man as I spoke. I took the girl's hands as I helped them down the step. Mudo again. Inga. Harold gave me a wave and pushed a button on the register. He began to count the till, silently mumbling to himself. Once outside, the humid night air hung heavy around us. I met Jacob's eyes and the expression on his face told me he knew I was uneasy. Let's get everyone loaded up then, he said as he began to corral all of us into the truck. Alex, hop up front with me and Kelsey. Alex started to protest until he saw Sabrina sliding into the back seat. He shot a quick glance at me that said, You owe me, and then climbed in. Jacob started the truck, and we watched as Harold locked the front door of the store. The scene was bathed in the yellow rays of the headlights. Kelsey shot her hand out the window and hit a button on her key ring. The little silver car next to us honked. And with that, we were all on our way. So what are the rules again? Nikki asked as she chewed on a piece of gum. It's boys against girls, Alex instructed. He pulled cans of beer out of a small ice chest and offered one to everybody. If you see any kind of animal, you yell, critter, critter, roadkill counts. Since when does roadkill count? Kelsey said as she took a sip. 
Critter, critter! Alex replied, pointing to a dead opossum on the side of the road. Since I saw that little guy on our way into town, rules are rules. You cheater! Kelsey gave Alex a playful slap and turned to look at Sabrina and Nikki in the back seat. Well, who's first? What do you mean? Asked Nikki. I got it, Sabrina said as she pulled off her shirt. I thought I was going to pass out until I realized she had a tank top on underneath. Think of it like strip poker. Oh, okay. I'm following now. Nikki <laughs> laughed. You really have to make your own fun down here, huh? When you don't have movie theaters or bowling alleys, you figure something out. Jacob said as he turned the truck down another dirt road. A lot different than the city, huh? You have no idea. Nikki thought you still lived in teepees. Kelsey threw her head back in laughter, almost <laughs> spilling her beer. Hey, I told you not to tell them that. Nikki buried her face in her hands as she tried to hide her embarrassment. It's fine, I told her. Most people don't know what to expect when they get to Oklahoma. Cowboys and Indians are part of it. But the Seminoles never lived in teepees. We're from Florida. Our people lived close to the water. Critter! Alex yelled as we passed the doe with the missing ear we had seen earlier. Oh, come on! Kelsey said as she took her shirt off. I think you're setting us up. No way. We're just paying attention. The night settled around us as the truck rumbled down the winding roads. The dense canopies of trees on either side framed our path. I would sneak an occasional look at Sabrina. Her face bathed in the silver glow of the moonlight, left me wanting her more than I ever had. Every now and then, the headlights would catch the shadow of a creature darting across the road, or the glinting eyes of an animal watching from the bushes. The game continued, accompanied by the hum of cicadas and chirping crickets. Tell us about the stuff around here. Kelsey pulled a sock off while she spoke. Nikki's never heard of any of it. We shouldn't really talk about that stuff at night, Jacob said as he fiddled with the radio. Please, Nikki pouted. She leaned forward and rubbed Jacob's shoulder. What do you think, Miko? My cousin asked. That stuff creeps me out, but I love hearing about it. Sabrina looked at me with big round eyes. I think it's so cool you know about all that. It's probably fine, I told him. The idea of pleasing the girl next to me was heavy on my mind. The advice of my elders was not. As long as nobody whistles or anything. Okay, then. Jacob pulled the truck to the side of the road and killed the engine. I'll tell you about Stegeni. Oh, I haven't heard this one. Kelsey shifted with anticipation. Have you ever heard an owl outside your window at night? Most people think of the owl as a symbol of wisdom, but not the Seminoles. The owl is an omen and a symbol of corruption. He flies on the winds of death, a silent killer. Jacob's words were soft and everyone in the truck scooted towards him to hear his tale. We don't like owls because they are the favorite form of the Stegeni. Form? What do you mean? Nikki asked. The Stegeni are shapeshifters. They change the way they are perceived so that they can get away with the things that they do. Awful things. We have medicine men, you know. Some of those men take the abilities they have and use them for evil. They hide behind their magic to take innocent lives. Jacob continued to lower his voice to a whisper. The girls in the truck were hanging onto his every word. Stegeni are powerful creatures. They find a home to target and use their medicine to put everyone inside into a trance. Then they use someone inside to open the door for them usually a kid or an elderly person. It's harder for them to fight off the medicine, but he has to be invited in. Everyone inside will be completely under their control. Jacob paused and surveyed the truck. The people inside won't remember a thing. The Stegeni can do anything he wants to them while they're under his spell. What do you mean he can do anything he wants? Kelsey's voice trembled slightly. The atmosphere inside the truck became more charged. The shadows outside seemed to become deeper. The girl's eyes darted around with every rustle that came from the underbrush. There's only two reasons a Stegeni enters a home. Jacob held up two fingers as he spoke. One, he wants to extend his life. The Stegeni can live forever as long as he has victims. They'll go into a home and use their medicine to reach inside someone and pull their heart out. 
the Stagani will eat the beating heart. It gives them power. Gross! Nikki gagged a bit. The second reason is worse depending on how you look at it. I interrupted. Jacob raised his hand to shush me. The men who walk the path of the Stegani are just that. Men. And men have desires. If they find a woman that they want, they use their medicine to visit her every night. They can use a woman for years. They'll never know it. No. Stop it. Absolutely not. Kelsey put her hands up in protest. How can you stop one? Nikki was visibly nervous as she spoke. There are only a few ways. The tribe guards those secrets closely. But there is one way to guarantee us to Genny never visits your home. The girls were all but clamoring to Jacob as the secret to prevent such an awful fate was about to be revealed. How? Kelsey asked. What do we need to do? It's simple, Jacob said as he turned to face the steering wheel and started the truck back up. You just have to find a couple Seminole boys and give them a kiss. You asshole! Kelsey reached over and slapped him on the back of the head. We all laughed, and he put the truck back into gear. Hold on, Jacob. Roll down the windows. I told him before we drove off. Everyone needs to spit four times. What? How come? Sabrina asked me. Our grandma always told us that we shouldn't talk about that stuff. But if we did, spit four times. It's kind of a cleanser. The laughter of Jacob's joke faded into the night air, and we all leaned out the windows. The cool breeze whipped around us as we sent our mingled unease out into the wind. Nikki made a face, but she followed suit. Better safe than sorry, right? Alex said. I think it's better not to test anything that may be out there. I nodded. I felt a little silly, but the weight of tradition sat heavy upon my shoulders. Our elders didn't teach us lessons without a reason. Jacob revved the engine and the truck lurched forward. The headlights cut through the dark as we all settled back into our seats. That guy in the store kind of gave me the creeps, Nikki told us, her words cutting through the silence. Really? I thought he was all right. I'm pretty sure he lives somewhere around me, Sabrina said. I see him walking a lot when I go on runs. Never talk to him now. I caught Jacob's eyes in the rearview mirror, and the two of us exchanged nervous glances. Anyone want another beer? Alex asked as he dug around in his ice chest. We're almost out. No, I'm good. Kelsey answered. I have to drive home still. I think I'll just drop everyone off, Jacob told her. Y'all hit it pretty hard earlier. I'll take you to get your car in the morning. That's fine with me. Kelsey snatched the bottle Alex held in his hand. We can burn it down. The truck's engine rumbled on as it devoured mile after mile of winding dirt roads. I felt my hand moving closer and closer to Sabrina's until our fingers were intertwined. We both looked in opposite directions for fear of how the other might react. Through the warmth of her palm, I could feel the rapid beat of her heart. It was an unspoken admission that we were both nervous. The two of us were lost in our own world and had long forgotten the game everyone else was playing. I was working up the courage to ask her about prom when I heard Alex's voice. Critter, critter! He said as he pointed to a cow that had found its way out of the pasture. Ah, shit! Kelsey slapped her leg. You've got to be cheating. I'm in my underwear! Alex snapped back. We're getting our asses kicked! Sabrina, you're up. Nikki said. We're almost to our skivvies, too. Oh, yeah. Sabrina's voice carried a twinge of reluctance as she unwound her fingers from mine. The loss of her touch left a longing in me I had never felt before. She offered a sheepish smile and turned to the group as she shrugged off her tank top. My bad, guys. Haven't been paying much attention. Her top joined the pile of discarded clothing on the floor. I suddenly found all the clothes scattered around infinitely fascinating. The idea of looking at her and invading her privacy felt wrong somehow. I let my hand wander back to the spot where I had found hers, but only empty space was there now. Doubt started to creep in. Was I being weird? What if she was just trying to avoid an awkward situation, so she let me hold her hand? Was I the creepy guy now? I was grappling with uncertainty when Sabrina grabbed my hand and squeezed it. 
I turned to look at her, and without thinking, my hand shot straight to her chest. Sabrina, when did this happen? I asked as my hands traced three deep cuts above her left breast. The scratches were made by the talons of an owl. The elders had told me stories of the mark. There was no mistaking it. Whoa, whoa, she slapped my hand back. What the hell's wrong with you? You can't just touch me like that. I ignored the anger in her voice. It was only background noise to the concern that throbbed in my temples. Sabrina, how did you get those cuts? Did you wake up with them? The playful spirit that had animated our group was gone, snuffed out like a flame in the wind. Everyone was looking at Sabrina now. The mood was somber and the game was forgotten. Biko, drop it! Jacob's voice was a command. I think everyone's had too much to drink. I'm gonna get everyone home. I think that's a good idea, Kelsey said. Can we stay with you, Sabrina? We're not far from your house. Yeah, my parents won't care. Sabrina pulled her shirt back on while she spoke. I'm ready to get some sleep anyways. The truck fell silent as we drove towards Sabrina's house. The innocence of the evening was now a distant memory. Even the usual nighttime sounds felt muted. It was like the world outside held its breath. Jacob steered the truck with intention as if he was on a mission. I looked to Sabrina, but her gaze was locked on the passing fence posts outside the window. A part of me wanted to tell her the truth, but the other part didn't want to scare her. The tires of the truck began to hum with a steady rhythm as we pulled onto an asphalt road. I was so lost in my thoughts that I almost didn't see the massive shadow swoop down from the trees above us. Jacob, stop! I yelled, but my warning was too late. The dark shape hit the front of the truck with a thud and explosion of feathers. What the hell was that? Mickey screamed as Jacob tried to stop the truck. The brakes squealed as the truck skidded to a halt. What the fuck? Alex peered over the dash and out the windshield. Did that thing come from the sky? The engine idled with a low growl that felt out of place in the quiet that covered the night. A mild fog seemed to creep out from the trees around us. The tendrils of mist swirled around the headlight's glow as if they were searching for the creature we had just hit. We need to check on it. Sabrina's voice was low. What if it's still alive? That's what I'm worried about. Kelsey said as she sunk deeper into her seat. I heard a click as Sabrina pulled the handle on her door and pushed it open. Don't let her get out. You know what that was. Jacob stared straight ahead. His knuckles were white against the steering wheel. I wasn't going to, I said as I reached across her lap and pulled the door shut. We need to get out of here. Sabrina, how far are we from your house? Jacob asked without taking his eyes off the road. Less than a mile. We were pretty close. Her voice quivered. The reality of the situation was starting to set in. Do you have any red string? I asked as I pulled a fan of feathers out from the center console. Red string? Why does that matter? Confusion and fear flashed in Sabrina's eyes. Can you two just tell us what the hell is going on? Nikki was on the verge of tears. I could feel the group shifting towards panic. Fear was seeping into the truck carried on the winds of the unknown. Do you have red string at your house or not? Jacob's patience was running thin. Yeah, I'm sure. Sabrina put her hands to her head in an attempt to organize her thoughts. My mom likes to knit and stuff. We have to have some somewhere. My, my shoestrings are red. Kelsey's breathing was heavy and she had to fight to get the words out. She turned and held up one of her shoes. I snatched it from her and began pulling the laces out. This will work, I told her. Go, Jacob. I'll have them done before we get there. My fingers danced as I wound the small rope into the knots my grandmother taught me. Jacob revved the engine, and we left the scene without another word between us. The others in the car had resigned themselves to being in our care. They suddenly found themselves strangers in the land that was their home. As we pulled away, I heard the shrill laughter of an owl, and then another. The owl's laughing and hooting followed us all the way to Sabrina's driveway. It felt like the mist and the noise was closing in on us. We were on the verge of suffocation when a porch light beaconed to us in the distance. We had made it. Alex, you need to stay here with them, I told my friend as I handed him the feathers with the red string wound around their quills. Hang one of these above every door and window. It'll keep you all safe. Where are you all going? 
he asked while he stepped down from the truck, his brow furrowed with a mixture of fear and acceptance. Don't worry about it, Jacob told him. Just keep an eye on everyone here. Try not to go to sleep if you can help it. I jumped out from the back seat after Sabrina. Outside the truck, the mist clung to my skin like a cold sweat. My hand twitched with the urge to grab hers. I wanted to comfort her, but to do so would mean revealing the truth of the situation. We watched as our friends made a silent march to the front door. The chorus of laughter from the owls was the only noise we could hear as they stepped inside. I climbed back into the front seat of the truck where my cousin was lost in thought. What's the plan? I asked. We don't have time for a ceremony to make an arrow, he told me. We're gonna have to do this the old way. You got a knife on you? Yeah, I do. It's the one Uncle Jack gave me. That should work. We need to find wherever he's changing. It has to be around here somewhere. The truth of Jacob's words hit me. The scratches on her were fresh. I don't think he has full control yet. No, I don't think so either. It takes four days. Jacob pulled the steering wheel around and we pulled out of the driveway. I caught a flicker of light from the front of the house where Sabrina had pulled back a curtain. A sadness fell over me when I saw her. She was an unwitting pawn in a game of desire and flesh. I flashed her a smile and shot a thumbs up at her. The torture she didn't even know she was a part of would end tonight. The truck's headlights cut through the darkness like twin lances as we searched for any sign of the Stegeni. We followed the dirt roads and our tires pit the gravel and dry leaves beneath us. Jacob steered us along with an assured but cautious grip. Who do you think it is? I wondered out loud while I looked at the full moon above us. I don't know. It seems like it's always the ones you least expect. We rounded a curve and our high beams caught a lone figure walking down the road with an obvious limp. Jacob brought the truck to a stop and the man continued to walk towards us. That's Harold, I said as I squinted my eyes. He's holding his arm and he looks pretty banged up. Fuck, it might be him. Jacob rolled down his window as our cousin approached us. We can't win this head on, even if he's injured. Just run him over. Wouldn't do us any good. There's rules here, you know that. Harold seemed to be carried forward on the fog. The mist swirled around his silhouette and a deep oppressive feeling settled over us. The air grew colder and I felt myself start to shiver. Each breath left a small cloud hanging in the air, impossible for a summer night. With every step Harold took, a quiet but sharp thud resonated in the silence of the night. The man's presence felt like a noose around my neck. As he got closer, I found it was difficult to breathe. Harold came to a stop by Jacob's window, and I could see that his arm was set at an unnatural angle. A dark stain was spread across the fabric of his sleeve. His eyes reflected a lifetime of secrets and unspoken knowledge. He stared straight through both of us, as if he was looking into our souls. Harold, Jacob started to speak, but his voice was betrayed by a quiver of fear. Are you all right? Harold lifted his uninjured arm as if to tell us to wait. The shadows seemed to dance around him like he was perpetually out of focus. I found my eyes drawn to his dry, cracked lips. A dribble of streaming red liquid fell from the corners of his mouth. He surveyed the two of us and then finally spoke. You boys know this story about the gar and the old catfish? Harold's voice was different. It was rougher than normal and carried an ancient tone to it. I don't think so. Jacob answered. The gar that swims in these waters is an old beast. He has scales that protect him and teeth that fight for him. He is the most feared predator in these creeks and rivers. A hunter that would make the ancestors proud. But when he is young, he does not know the ways of his people or his place in the river. Harold sniffed the air. One day, a young gar came across an old catfish that was eating a perch. The gar with his tough scales and rigid teeth demanded that the catfish hand over the perch, but the catfish refused. The gar swam at the catfish, ready to attack, but it was no match for the flathead. The old catfish opened its mouth wide and swallowed the gar whole. The gar's journey was over 
before it ever really got started. Jacob and I trembled in our seats, unable to speak. Harold's words were ice in our veins. You need to know your place in the world, boys, he continued. It's an important lesson. Don't swim into waters you don't understand and never come between a man and his meal. Neither of us could speak, but we never got the chance to try. Harold tapped the side of the truck as if to say goodbye and stepped back into the darkness. His form merged into the shadows and left us with nothing but the haunting echo of his voice. The two of us suddenly gasped for air as if we had been underwater. <gasps> Shit, I said, shaking in my seat. I guess that answers that question. We might be at the wrong end of the spear here, Miko. Jacob told me as he scanned the rearview mirror. He's headed towards Sabrina's. The feathers we gave them will buy us a little time, but he's going to change again soon. We have to find his hiding spot. Jacob maneuvered the truck back onto the road. We drove for a while in silence. Harold's warning seemed to be sitting in the cab with us, and I knew there was truth in his words. We circled back around towards Sabrina's house, and I spotted a familiar shape on the edge of the road. Pull over here, I told Jacob. Look who it is. The doe with the missing ear stood in front of the tree line. She pawed at the ground as if trying to tell us something. That's the third time tonight. You think she's got something for us? The deer motioned with her head and walked further into the woods. She stopped and turned to see if we were following. I opened my door and stepped out of the truck. A small wind blew and left a chill in the air. I think it's our best bet, I said as I looked at the towering oak trees that surrounded us. A deep primal fear erupted from the core of my being, but the thought of my friends pushed me forward. I wanted Sabrina to be safe. Jacob placed his hand on my shoulder. We'll get it done. Let's go. I kept my hand on the hilt of my knife as we wandered through the darkness. The moon was our only guide as we traversed the thick briars and undergrowth. I could see soft rays of gray light peeking out from the branches overhead. My heart pounded in my chest as we went deeper into the domain of our enemy. I was a child confronting the boogeyman. The deer in front of us turned every now and then to make sure we were keeping pace. I kept my eyes open for any movement, but the stillness in the air told me no other living beings were around. I thought about the moment when Sabrina and I held hands, and I hoped it wouldn't be the last time. Our guide stopped suddenly and watched a small collection of trees. An ungodly retching boomed out from just past the tree line. The gagging and vomiting continued between screams of pain. The noise was visceral and echoed through the woods with a primal intensity that made my stomach churn. As we approached the edge of the clearing, the deer that led us there darted away. Mado, I whispered, wishing her a long and happy life. The orchestra of bile-inducing sounds suddenly stopped. A dark figure shot upwards from the treetops. Its form was barely visible against the night sky. The thing hovered there for a moment and I held my breath. It seemed to be made of smoke and shadow. The sound of laughter erupted from the specter. The maniacal chuckles morphed into the sounds of an animal until it was an owl that taunted us from above. A shiver ran down my spine. I felt my spirit being driven deeper into the ground with each flap of the Stegeni's wings. Jacob stepped further into the clearing, and my body seemed to follow without my permission. I was doing my best to keep myself standing when I felt a drop of thick liquid hit my face. I looked up, but there wasn't a cloud in the sky. I wiped my cheek and sniffed the substance. Oh, that's rank, I gagged. What the hell is that? Jacob walked over to me and I heard the soft rustle of leaves as another drop hit the ground. He's smart, Jacob said as he peered up into the canopy. I've heard stories, but didn't know they still did that. What do you mean? I asked. He changed up there. You're gonna have to start climbing. Jacob pointed to an oak tree. Here, I'll give you a boost. I stepped onto Jacob's hands, and he hoisted me up to one of the lower hanging branches. I grabbed it and pulled myself into the tree. What am I looking for here? Back in the old times, they trained dogs to find the spot where they changed. They could sniff him out, you know? 
So the Stegani started changing up in the trees. I followed the sounds of dripping higher and higher. I worked my gaze upwards until a grotesque sheen caught my eye. Nestled among the gnarled branches and leaves was a quivering mass of flesh and blood that pulsated as if it were alive. The organs were slick and glistened in the moonlight. The pile of intestines writhed in a sickening rhythm that blew a foul odor towards me. I felt the contents of my stomach leave through my mouth when the smell hit me. Shit, man, this is awful. I said, doing my best to hold my breath. They can't take it all with them, so they throw them up. Have to leave them somewhere. It's one of the few times they're vulnerable. Take the knife and put an end to him. I raised the blade above my head with one hand over my nose. I was ready to plunge it in, but a sudden hesitation seized me. The knife trembled in my grip. The weight of what I was about to do was heavy. I thought about Harold at our last family reunion with a cup of coffee in his wrinkled hands. We were never close, but I was about to kill him. His heart held great evil, but he was still a man the same as me. He's a shell of what he used to be, Jacob said from below, as if he could hear my thoughts. It's not easy to take a life. We're both young, but he chose his path and we're about to choose ours. We will protect our community, not harm it. I looked back to the vile, twisted mass and a sense of responsibility pushed the blade forward. The reaction was immediate. The organs convulsed and emitted a sound that was half scream, half gurgle. A dark ichor ran out from the pile and coated the knife and my hands. I slashed and stabbed at the intestines from my perch in the tree. The mass of flesh and viscera seemed almost aware of my attacks and pulsed and wriggled as if it were trying to get away from me. I was relentless and soon the only movement in the canopy was from my continued assault. The innards of the Stegeni were now a pile of mush before me. I think, I said, trying to catch my breath. I think we did it. It's done, Miko, come on down. I moved to reposition myself when an ear-piercing scream filled the air. I saw a flash of shadow and felt the bite of a razor as it was drug across my face. The dark shape darted back and forth, assaulting my ears with its screams. I used my hands to cover my face as the owl's talons reached for the soft flesh of my eyes. I could hear Jacob calling out to me below, but I couldn't make out what he was saying. I felt a powerful force crash into me from the side. The impact sent me tumbling back towards earth. Branches cracked my ribs and I could see the ground rushing back up to meet me. I tried to grab something, anything, to stop my fall, but all I found was air. The Stegeni's laughter echoed out from the forest as I hit the ground with a crunching thud. Jacob, run! I tried to yell, but the words dribbled out of my mouth with a gurgle of blood. My vision blurred, and all I could do was surrender to the void. I was slow to return to consciousness. I had the sense of being tethered to a body that felt distant and heavy. The sounds of being and familiar voices seeped into my awareness and helped pull me back to reality. Rows and rows of white ceiling tiles suddenly came into view, flanked by a harsh light. I blinked repeatedly as I tried to focus my eyes. I tried to move, but a wave of dizziness washed over me and anchored me to the bed. The sterile smell of latex and antiseptics filled my nostrils. I turned my head and noticed an IV in my arm and bandages that wrapped my torso. The fog in my mind started to clear and fragments from that night flashed before me. Jacob! I yelled as I tried to sit up again. I was still unsuccessful and fell back into the bed that held me. He's okay. My grandma's voice surprised me. I hadn't noticed her in the corner of the room where she sat working a crochet needle. I'm proud of you boys. Grandma, where are we? The finest facility in all of the Indian health services. She laughed. Harold was here too, you know. Didn't make it. Died of internal bleeding. The two of us sat in silence, except for the soft click of her tools. They have to change back before daybreak. I'm sure he knew it was useless to try, but I guess he figured it was better than burning to death. I'm sorry, Grandma. Don't apologize. You take what you learned and carry it with you. You'll need it again one day. I watched as she slowly stood. The wrinkles in her told the story of a woman filled with wisdom. You missed the prom, but I've got a surprise for you. 
I watched as the matriarch of our family shuffled to the door. She opened it, and on the other side was Sabrina. I told her you would wake up today, my grandma told me as she ushered her inside. Poor girl has been worried sick. Sabrina gave me a small wave. Hey, Miko. Her voice sent waves of warmth through me. I'm really glad you're okay. I'll leave you two alone, my grandmother said, excusing herself from the room. I've got some pizza on the way for you. Maybe not the first date you had in mind, but I think it'll do. Sabrina and I both winced at the mention of the word date, but neither of us protested. The door shut with a heavy click, and she pulled one of the chairs close to my bed. I'm so sorry about the other night. I was out of line. Sabrina cut me off as she took my hand and squeezed it. Your grandma told me what you did. I'm glad you're here, and I'm glad we're together. Let's just leave it at that. She nestled herself underneath my arm and snuggled up close to me. Let's turn on a movie and relax. You deserve it. I think that's a good idea. Thanks for listening. If you enjoy these stories, be sure to subscribe to the podcast and check out some more of my episodes here.